What are we going to cover for this week's video? Let's see. Amazon's Rings of Power series is the most expensive television show ever made in all of human history. Wow. Amazon has poured so much money into this show that if it fails, it could destroy all prospects of Amazon Prime making any future original shows. Wow. I bet with so much money behind it and so much writing on this show being successful, Amazon has hired some top tier writers with a long list of amazing successes under their belts. Let's just check and see what else they've done on the old IMDb. Oh look, they wrote absolutely nothing. What? Yes, I'm sure you've heard Rings of Power is not good. What you might have also heard is that it's woke. And is it? And is wokeness the reason it's bad? Of course it... maybe? I'm not sure. Because even though the show is, in fact, bad, I don't think it's going to go in the direction people think. But we'll get into that later. First, let's go over the episodes. Episode 1. The show opens on Kid Gladriel making an origami boat. Of course, a boy smashes the boat with a rock, and we get our first glimpse of the elven patriarchy. Though girl boss Gladriel doesn't take no crap from no boy and starts smacking the kid around. Glad Girl then has a nice chat with her big brother where he explains why boats float in stone sink. Gladbro contributes to women and not succeeding in STEM fields by explaining that boats float because they look up to the light and stones sink because they look down at the darkness. I do not believe that is correct. I believe you are reasoning by analogy, classifying objects and phenomena according to superficial observation rather than empirical evidence. You might wonder why this bizarre explanation is being shoehorned in the beginning of the show. The reason is because this is the entire theme of the show for Glad Girl. And we'll get back to this. Galadriel questions whether her bro is just trolling her and wants to know what happens if she mistakes the light reflecting off the water for the light in the sky. Her brother whispers something in her ear that we can't hear, so I guess we just have to keep watching. It's a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off for him. Anyways, the show then attempts to recreate the fantastic opening montage of Lord of the Rings, but fails and makes one far more boring. We learned a great bad guy, who we don't actually see, named Morgoth, has wrecked the elves, driving them from their nice policed gated community of Valinor to the slums of Middle-earth. The elves are wicked pissed about this and fight Morgoth legions of orcs and humans. Yes, some humans have teamed up with Morgoth because they were mad at the elves for gentrifying Middle-earth. The fight lasts for a long time, and Middle-earth is all beat up, and we meet one of Morgoth's sidekicks, a powerful Deuterino named Sauron. Now that we're up to speed, we find out oh, no. Glad Girl's Gladbro is dead! That'll teach him to keep secrets from the audience. Gladbro got killed by Sauron off-screen, because, you know, we wouldn't want there to be actually emotional stakes or drama in this television show. Sauron leaves this mysterious mark on his body, ooh, this is gonna come up later, and the war ends, with Morgoth being defeated, but Sauron is still out there somewhere. So Glad Girl swears to find him and take revenge. But whoopsie, hundreds of years pass and hide and seek champion Sauron can't be found. But Girl Glad won't give up and her and her elf team are climbing up a scenic ice wall. Hey, you know, if the elves are thousands of years old, you'd think someone would have taught them to rock climb without risking the lives of everyone on the team. Normally one person climbs up first and puts a rope and a bunch of hooks so everyone can just follow? You know, so you don't smack ice into your buddy's face? <laughs> Anyways, the team thinks they've been searching 100 years too many and that Girl Glad is a giant safety risk. They want to turn back, but Boss Glad is consumed by revenge to get her white whale. I mean, white patriarchy. I mean, white Sauron. Luckily for everyone, they just happen to finally find Sauron's Fortress of Solitude. Inside, Boss Glad literally punches her own reflection to find a secret passageway where Sauron might have been. That whole punching the reflection thing and why they did that is gonna come up later. There they find Sauron's symbol that was on her brother. Boss Glad claims it was left to guide the orcs? Um, excuse me, ma'am. How do you know that? Is it like an arrow? Is it a word? Is it a location? Why would she assume this? When Sauron left the same mark on her brother hundreds of years ago, was it Sauron trying to tell her to find him? What is she talking about? Maybe he just thought it looked 
cool. Maybe it's just an after effect of his magic. But don't worry. We're going to find out in episode three what that sign means. And it absolutely makes no sense. Anyways, Girl Glad doesn't find her white whale, but something far worse. A cis white Twitter troll who pops out and gives the show a bad rating. So Jeff Bezos tells Girl Glad to delete it from existence. Now, you know how in Lord of the Rings and even The Hobbit, elves have always been shown to be badass fighters? <laughs> well, not here, loser. Nope, since the script wants to show how awesome Girl Glad is, the rest of her team literally just stand around and get their heads knocked in when one of the goofiest looking things you can imagine happens. Yes, her entire team literally does nothing of value, and Girl Glad solos a troll. Jeez, if only she was around in Moria. Wow. I'm so glad this new character, well, I guess this old character, well, this new old character is so much better than the OG characters. Oh, what a loser! After Boss Girl kills the troll, along with any inkling that she could ever possibly be in danger, because <laughs> why would you want that in a dramatic television show? The Soy Boy sidekicks mutiny and want to go home. Judging by the troll encounter, if I was Boss Glad, I would be worried that the Elf King just wanted to get rid of me and sent me off with this team of losers hoping I die. Anyways, it's time to finally meet the Hobbits. I I mean, <clears throat> Harfoots. Yes, definitely not trademark property hobbits that Amazon does not have access to. Nope, Harfoots. Apparently the Harfoots are all a bunch of xenophobic bigots that hate everyone who's not them. I did think it was a little too on the nose, Amazon, when the main Harfoot puts on a mega hat. Make Middle Earth great again. But there's one young hob, I mean Harfoot, named Nori, who wants adventure. But everyone in town is like, <laughs> Meanwhile in Elfville, we see young Elrond, who is not a girl boss, so he's just writing speeches like a loser instead of soloing trolls. After some lore is butchered for no apparent reason, he's informed that Glad Girl has returned home. I guess the soy boy sidekick army she had won her over. She meets with Elrond and it turns out that Captain Aglab here wants a new army, so she can follow that supposedly, definitely, totally is a real trail to finally catch her white Sauron. Only this time she wants a squad that wasn't trained as a joke. But the king is like, Bye bitch! Cause Glad Girl got in one little fight and the king got scared and said he was shipping her back off to Valair. We see celebratory fireworks reflecting off the dark, deep water. Hmm. I wonder if Gladriel can tell the difference. Evidently so, because despite Girl Glad suffering from survivor's guilt and almost wishing she was dead, Elblonde manages to talk Girl Glad into leaving the war and heading home. Meanwhile, we're introduced to the town without baths, where every human is gross and old. Well, everyone except the one town milf. Then we're introduced to Erendir. Yes, yes, he's a black elf. Blah, blah, big deal! Erendir is a soldier from a nearby outpost, stationed here to make sure these southern humans don't get out of line. Southern humans. The lot you lump us in with died off a thousand years ago. When are you people gonna let the past go? Oof. Yes, these humans are the descendants of the humans that sided with Morgoth a thousand years ago. So the elves, being the horrible racist that they are, still don't trust these humans for something their ancestors did. Jeez, why is everyone in the show racist? Anyway, after Aaron checks in at the bar, he sneaks off to the well area for some well-deserved well time with the town MILF. Aaron is, however, disappointed to find out that when the MILF said they were going to go swap seeds, she meant it in a far more literal sense than he wanted. Back at Elf Base, A-Rod learns the war is over and he's going home. Then his captain pulls a racism and declares that all humans suck. Yikes! Might want to read the room, sir! So Aaron goes to wish Town Milf goodbye and we learn she's a single mom and her son is probably A-Rod's. Oof, Amazon Prime. Really hitting the, uh, stereotypes here. I thought this show was supposed to be progressive. But a villager shows up with a poison cow. So A-Rod and Milf head east to find out what's going on in the next town, and everything's on fire. Meanwhile, Milf's son, through the power of your coincidence, just happens to find an evil sword with the mark of Sauron randomly underneath some guy's floorboards. I'm sure the show will explain why this item is here, right? We'll get back to this later. In the meantime, Girl Glad is all packed up and heading home. And we learn the real reason the king sent her off is because he had an elf vision that Girl Glad, in her quest for revenge, will actually end up helping unleash Sauron on Middle Earth. Interesting. I'm pretty sure this is exactly what will happen. We'll come back to this. Elblon is then assigned to a new project with Supreme Art Elf Lord Calabrimbor. The Dark Lord promised mercy! Gaze now upon the bright lord! I make 
No such offer! Wow, what a badass. I sure hope that show, Celebrimbor, is... Oh. 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 Sad. Art Elf wants to make something really cool, and he needs Elf Blonde to help him. Hopefully it's a time machine, and they plan to hire some competent writers to fix this mess. Anyways, back at Captain Anglad's ship, headed toward the Elven-gated community, the elves are getting ready for the baptism, when the sky opens up like a giant golden light vagina. Girl Glad rejecting the matriarchy steps back from the light vagina, and we finally find out what Dead Glad whispered to her all those centuries ago. Sometimes we cannot know until we have touched the darkness. Hmm, that's gonna be important later. So then the dumbest thing in the episode happens. No, probably the dumbest thing in the entire show. No, probably the dumbest thing on any television show currently airing. Galadriel rejects the light her brother told her about and jumps off the boat into the darkness as it gets teleported to Valinor. And her plan is just to swim back to Middle Earth. What? Are you serious? She's thousands of miles away from the shore, and she's just like, whatever, time to start swimming, I guess. Oh my god. Galadriel has the self-awareness of Forrest Gump. I just felt like running. You know, it really adds drama and tension to this story. When your main character is not only incredibly stupid and puts herself in insanely dangerous situations, but then isn't even bothered by it. Anyways, I have a lot to say about this scene. What it means, how I think they could have fixed it, but that'll all be saved for after the episode breakdown. Meanwhile, back at the Middle Earth, a meteorite streaks across the sky. Everyone watches it blaze by overhead as it crashes down near Harfoot Town, where Nori finds it. Inside the middle of the flaming crash crater is a disheveled looking naked man, who is probably definitely very likely assuredly all signs point to yes, Gandalf. I wonder how the xenophobic Harfoots will react. They're sending people that have lots of problems. Episode 2. Captain Aglad is swimming back to Middle-earth. Will she die? Are you serious? Of course not! Women are invincible! Swim, bitch! Meanwhile, Nori stands over the meteor crater. She wants to help this homeless man who is definitely not Gandalf. Seaweed's sidekick wants to puss out, but Nori makes her drag the exhibitionist extraterrestrial back to the Harfoot pace. Back in Flame Town, A-Rod and the Mill find an underground passage, and he makes the very unwise decision to explore it. Back in Elfland, Elblon meets with Arts and Crafts, who is having trouble getting enough new workers from the king to build a big forge that will most definitely be used to craft the Rings of Power. Elblon says he has an idea, so they go for a light, 100 mile plus stroll to the next realm, where they plan to eat salted pork and discuss outsourcing their contract work to dwarves. They stole our jobs and they plundered our wealth. I want to spend a second concentrating on how insane this shot is. Like, Celebrimbor and Elrond just go on what should at the very least be a day's journey to Casa Dune, but it looks like they just walk to the end of the block leisurely. They have no horses or carriage or guards or weapons or even a backpack with supplies. Nothing. It really makes it seem like they just walked off one green screen set to another ten feet away. Anyways, the dwarves aren't feeling particularly outgoing when the elves arrive and tell them they get lost. Fortunately, Elblond knows the dwarven safe word and invokes the right of smacking rocks. Reluctantly, the dwarves let Elblond into their super secret clubhouse, but Art Elf is sent home alone. Yep, not only did they just leisurely stroll here from an entire new city, but then Elblond just sends arts and crafts away like, Good luck getting back before nightfall! I hope you don't get jumped on the walk home! Inside the Dwarf City, Starbucks Blonde Roast has to break more rocks than his so-called dwarven friend, Durin, who is the prince, to stick around and talk about contracting non-union labor. If he fails, he has to GTFO. Many rocks are cracked, but ultimately El Blonde gives up, but asks Durin to escort him out so it's not a total loss. On the way out, we discover the reason Durin is mad is because El Blonde ghosted him for the past 20 years, and Durin is like, that's messed up, bro. And El Blonde is like, 20 years? I'm an immortal elf. That's like nothing, bro. And Durin is like, yeah, but I'm not immortal, bro. And also, you miss my wedding. And Elblond is like, oh yeah, my bad. So Elblond insists on apologizing to Durin's wife directly so he can spend more time hiring scabs. Of course, the two reconcile because bro love and also because, you know, the plot dictates it. And Durin is off to talk to the king. There we find out that the king has a super secret rock he's hiding in a box. This rock is so important. This box so magical that the king has special guards that literally stand there and their job is to merely just open this box. Well, I am king. Oh, king, I very nice. 
Anyways, Elliot, I mean Nori, is back at Harfoot headquarters hiding her ET. She's having a lot of trouble communicating with the hobo. It's just like the movie The Arrival, but instead of a crazy alien, Seaweed and her friends are just hanging out with a naked homeless man. Someone really needs to teach these kids about stranger danger. When the not clothed homeless man can control the weather, it means to escape would be better. However, it's not quite clear, but maybe besides Gandalf killing a bunch of fireflies, he also seems to maybe accidentally break Nori's dad's ankle or something? Meanwhile, Boss Glad is still doing that swimming across the entire ocean thing, when conveniently, she finds a bunch of humans floating on the wreck of a ship in the middle of the entire ocean. After an argument, she gets on for a brief second before getting the big racist vibes once the humans out there find out she's an elf and they throw her overboard. They're going back. They're going back. But the racists are eaten by a big sea monster that wrecked their ship originally, so yay. Serves them right. Luckily for the plot, however, Captain Aglad and one human man named How Bland escape. Turns out How Bland is on the run from a bunch of smelly orcs who chased him away from the Confederacy. I mean, the Southlands. So Captain Aglad wants him to take her there so she can kill more orcs. Anyways, single human MILF returns home to warn her fellow village mates of the danger to come. I guess they don't really like their neighbors because once they find out they're all dead, they're like, meh, who cares? I'm not leaving. Then they call her an uppity hysterical Karen and don't believe the danger is real. So single MILF returns home to find the tunnel she abandoned. A rod in seems to run under her house and whoops, there's an orc inside. Now I will give the show some credit here. Shocking, I know. As in this fight, her kid actually helps her take out the monster instead of just hiding uselessly in the corner as we see in so many other movies and shows. Anyway, she presents the orc head to the town and says, Told you so, idiots. And they finally decide to leave. So they all go, and Single Milf's son is smart enough to leave that evil Sauron sword behind. <laughs> Just kidding. After it starts sucking his blood out of his arm, he's like, you know, this seems like a not cursed good sword that drinks blood. I'ma take it with me. Meanwhile, after some unimportant shenanigans where girl boss actually gets saved by How Bland, they randomly wash up on a- another group of humans, only this time in an actual ship. Jeez, with the amount of people she keeps running into, this ocean must be tiny. Episode 3 starts and oh no a rod has been captured by orcs they drag him off to work in their orc trench slash tunnel and we discover that the orcs are in fact the dumbest builders of all time if sunlight burns orcs and we assume that they're building these trenches so they can move around to avoid sunlight why would they spend so much time and energy building out these walls in this trench and only take two seconds making a flimsy cloth filled with holes for the roof when that's the you know main direction the sun comes from wait why are they even making a trench instead of a tunnel wait if they can just wear clothing to protect them from the sun isn't that easier than building trenches that span an entire continent? What is their plan here? Anyways, thanks to the script, I mean, a loudmouth orc, we learn their leader's name is Adar. The orcs kick Aaron's ass and drop him off with his elf buddies to dig. Wait a minute. So the orc's plan is to secretly build these tunnels and not alert the elves, otherwise that would bring down the wrath of the entire elf army before they're even ready to fight them. So why would they kidnap a squad of elves who just received a message to return home? If the elf squad doesn't come back, obviously someone's going to go look for them. I could buy that orcs are just stupid and wouldn't care about this, but this Adar guy looks like he's an elf or Sauron or someone with half a brain. Yet this is just the dumbest move ever. Also, it would add additional tension and stakes to the scene if Aaron is the only elf captured, because then his escape would mean he would be the one that could warn the rest of the elves and get reinforcements. But now the rest of the elves will just show up on their own if no one does anything. Back on the high seas, we learn that Captain Aglad and Howbland have been rescued by a ship on its way to the island kingdom of Numenor. In Numenor, we learn the Numenorians got their fancy island after helping out the elves in the fight against Morgoth. While Howbland's ancestors got dirt town because they all sided with evil. Unfortunately, the honeymoon with the Numenorians doesn't last long and now, for reasons which the show doesn't explain, they're all big race racist against elves. Girl Glad and How Bland are escorted to the Numenorean leadership where Girl Glad has the perfect opportunity to impress us, the audience, with her intelligence, her wit, her diplomacy skills. Just kidding! Instead, Boss Glad acts like a huge asshole and just yells at this lady in charge, takes credit for the birth of their entire country, and demands a ship to fight Sauron. Wow. Arrogant asshole and stupid. Why am I supposed to like this character? Fortunately, Hal Bland is here to mansplain to Girl Glad how to communicate with people nicely. So the queen says, sure, fine, whatever, I'll think about it. Anyways, thanks to the power of the script, I mean coincidence, we find out that the son of the captain who saved Girl Glad is none other than Sildor. You know, that guy that defeated Sauron but then got corrupted 
didn't destroy the ring in the beginning of Lord of the Rings. Well, now you're forced to just watch him be a boring character doing boring things for no apparent reason. Back in the Confederacy, the elves are plotting their escape from their orc masters when a dispute breaks out over a big old tree. The elves want to dig the trench around it, which would save them, like, a lot of time. But the orcs are just completely stupid and evil, so they want to rip the tree out, which would be pointless and take a really long time. The story expects you, the audience, to know the elves are big tree huggers, but they don't tell you that, but whatever, it doesn't matter. After an argument breaks out, an orc captain appears and says, Kids got moxie. And offers them some water. They all think it's some kind of trick, but after a very, 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 very slow, long, drawn-out scene of them touching the water, smelling the water, tasting the water, it turns out there's nothing wrong with the water. So the first guy drinks it. The second elf drinks it. The third elf oh, no. gets his throat cut. Um, what? Like, what was the point of the whole water thing? If you were just gonna stab them, just stab them. They're unarmed and chained down. What the hell was the point of that whole sequence? So this character we know nothing about dies in Aaron's arms. Aaron is really acting his face off in this scene. The music reminds me that I'm supposed to feel something here, but instead I just ponder how we're three episodes into the most expensive TV show ever made, and I know and care so little about any of these characters. In fact, why do I care about these elves who are all giant racist against the human villagers? I mean, I'm guessing most of the people watching this show are also human, go figure, and now these racist elves are all orc slaves. Am I supposed to feel bad? Get what you fucking deserve! So after Rando Elf dies, Aaron agrees to cut down the tree. What? There's like a billion roots. Cutting the top of the tree doesn't solve the problem, but okay. Aaron chops at the big old tree with Middle Earth's most poorly designed axe. Jeez, I guess these people are gonna be here all week. No wonder it took Sauron hundreds of years to get his army together. Back on Numenor, Girl Glad escaped her guest quarters, but wait! She's immediately intercepted by the ship's captain who saved her, Elendil. After she insults him and threatens his life, nice way of shooting gratitude, you bitch, Eldil's like, I like your moxie, kid, and decides to help her for no reason. Until Tells her about some special library. Girl Glad, who's literally had a one-track mind for revenge this entire series, is then, for some reason, which is never explained to us, excited to go to this library. Okay. So Ellen takes Girl Glad's slow motion horseback riding, and for some reason, which the show doesn't explain, she's really, really, really happy about horseback riding. Like Glad Girl literally goes goblin mode on that horse. Wow, uh, what's happening here, Amazon? I thought this show was made for children. The only thing I can think of is that there are no horses on Middle Earth, so this is supposed to be something she liked to do as a kid or, or something, but since the show doesn't tell us, it just comes off as creepy. Oh my god. Oh, this makes me uncomfortable. Meanwhile, Howbland decides Numenor is way better than the South Dixie land he's from and wants to live here forever. So he tries to get a job as a smith. Like he really, really wants the smith job for some reason. We're gonna come back to this. But wouldn't you know it, the Numenorians are a bunch of dirty libtards and have strict labor unions so you can't work unless he joins one. So Howbland, in an overlong sequence, tries to steal someone's union badge, but whoops, gets caught. So he then goes full John Wick on them. Okay. Back at the Elven Library, we learned some super important information. Where did they get it? Well, there's a throwaway line that the Numenorians got this information from a prisoner. And this information is that Sauron's crazy symbol is actually a map. Wait, what? What prisoner would they have on an island nation that's not even part of Middle Earth that would have info about Sauron? But Wait, Sauron's symbol is a map of the Southlands, and we're told this is some kind of backup plan. That the symbol exists to tell orcs that in case Morgoth is defeated, meet up at the Southlands because we're going to turn it into Mordor. Wait. What? So let me get this straight. A thousand years ago, Sauron made his symbol a map of the mountains in the Southland just in case he loses the war? You think Morgoth was happy that his number two guy, Sigil, was literally a I'm pretty sure you're gonna lose the war boss sign? And also, wait, why would Sauron put his map where he wants orcs to go on Galadriel's brother's body? Or this stone in the snow castle? Why is it on this milf son's magic sword from a thousand years ago. Did Sauron design his helmet to match this map? Wait, do orc parents tell their orc children the secret meaning of the sign? Why wouldn't they just say to meet up at the Southlands? Why do they need a sign at all? This might be worse than Ray's magic Death Star wreckage dagger. 
Back in Harfootville, Seaweed and her friends are up to crazy adventures. Everyone was marching around screaming out a song about how dangerous it is to go off trail. Which they're so loud would probably alert everyone in the entirety of Middle Earth of their presence, but you know, whatever. How else can we shove it into the audience's faces some trait about the Harfoots culture that we already know? Later, they all find out about Gandalf. The big secret Seaweed's been keeping this whole time. And what big thing happens? What kind of crazy fallout occurs because of this? Absolutely nothing. Wow, great job, guys. I'm sure glad she was keeping this devastating secret. Anyway, Seaweed's dad still has a broken foot, which is big trouble for the migration plan tomorrow because apparently the Harfoots are such terrible people that they can't spare others to help people pull their carts when someone is injured. They literally just leave them there to die. Wow. I hate these people. But who could possibly pull Seaweed's cart if only Nori was friends with a giant human hobo with big strong arms and legs? It's a real mystery how they're gonna get out of this one, folks. Back at Numenor, we're exposed to some very exciting family drama with Isildur. Drama about school admissions. Wow. Very cool. Meanwhile, Girl Glad visits John Wick in jail and we find out he's actually a king? Okay. What? Apparently, she's pieced this together based on nothing more than some janky symbol he wears around his neck. You'd think if he was king, he'd at least mention that in his ironsmithing interviews, or... Also, I wonder why his subjects on the raft with him didn't act like he was king. Anyway, Girl Glad wants to help him redeem his bloodline, presumably by taking him to the Southlands where he can make amends for his ancestors swearing a blood oath to Morgoth. Wow. Isn't everyone worried Girl Glad is gonna free Sauron? Sure would suck if Howbland was Sauron and she ended up doing the exact opposite. Yes, supposedly there's been some leaks that Hellbland is Sauron, which makes me wonder, why the heck would Sauron be so concerned about getting a blacksmithing job here? Is this like a fight club thing? Is Hellbland possessed by the spirit of Sauron and is just a normal dude with Sauron's voice in his head or something? Wait a minute. I swear, if the reason Hellbland wanted that random smithing job is because he wanted to craft the one ring at this random forge, I will lose my fucking mind. Finally, we get back to Aaron. So the elves plan an escape attempt, but waited till after they already cut down that tree they cared about so much. Also notice how cutting the tree down accomplished literally nothing. And the problem was the roots, which are still right there. Nice. And of course all the elves but Aaron kind of suck in a fight, so they lose horribly. That's what you get for being racist. <laughs> Who knows what crazy excitement awaits us in episode 4. Will Galadriel get her Numenorian library card in the mail finally? Will Gandalf get a walking blister from cart duty? Will someone finally cut the roots of this tree? So, with the episode breakdown out of the way, let's get to the most important thing. Is it woke? Well, putting casting choices aside, does Gladriel suffer the same fate as She-Hulk? Her character doomed by woke showrunners, writing her too perfect. Well, that depends. Depends on where this is all going. See, most people are assuming, because it is in fact current year, that Gladriel is yet another woke character. A girl boss who no one listens to or believes, but in the end, will ultimately be proven correct. We've already seen this with Nori in the town MILF. And while I think it's a very safe bet to make that Galadriel will be the same, I don't actually think that's where this show is going. Usually when a character is written that way, they're motivated by something good, like wanting to save people. However, Galadriel isn't motivated by anything positive. She's not really motivated by stopping Sauron in order to save Middle-earth. Her primary motivation is revenge. In almost every scene she's in, she talks about wanting to get revenge. All she thinks about is getting revenge. Almost every other conversation she has is another person telling her to cool down her lust for revenge. She even signals that she has survivor's guilt to Elrond and always assumed she would end up dead in her quest to kill Sauron. This really isn't your typical girl boss character. Then we have the Elf King here saying he had a vision that Galadriel in her quest to kill Sauron will end up helping him. And of course, the infamous boat scene. Well, scenes if we include the beginning, where Galadriel's brother says boats float because they look up to the light and rocks sink because they look down to the darkness. The writers felt this terrible metaphor about finding light versus dark was so important that they had to put it right in the beginning of the show and then have a literal boat with a literal light sky and literal dark water scene to contrast it. The point of the metaphor is obviously about finding your way in life. That one should seek the light so that you can move forward and that seeking darkness only weighs you down and prevents you from progressing. Galadriel has spent the last few hundred years doing nothing but seeking darkness, both literally and metaphorically. Nothing but trying to seek revenge for an act that has already occurred. An act she can't change. The death of her brother. So Galadriel 
Carol is forever stuck in the past. She's not moving forward with her life. She's forever weighed down in the darkness and not following the light forward. The boat scene is a physical representation of this. Galadriel literally chooses the dark waters over the light in the sky. She asks her brother in the past how to find the light, and he says, sometimes you have to touch the darkness. Well, this is what Galadriel's been doing for the last hundred years or so, touching the darkness. I mean, remember in the first episode, there's literally a scene of Girl Glad punching herself in the face in order to continue chasing after Sauron. So I do think at the end of season one, Galadriel will end up being responsible for Sauron's release, or gaining more power. That the Elf King's vision will come true, and Galadriel will be at fault. Now, does this make the show or her character good? No, not really. The problem is that there's just nothing to like about her. You can create a compelling story about a character consumed by revenge, but this isn't it. Instead, she just comes off as unlikable, unsympathetic, and boring. I really wonder if the show originally wrote her to be a darker character, but some Amazon ex somewhere said, you can't do this in current year, make her a girl boss. So now instead we have this sort of unholy marriage between the two things. As for the horrendous boat scene itself, I do think that there's one of two ways to fix it. The first would be to go full dark. Galadriel is so overcome with the guilt of not being able to find her brother's killer that she feels she is unworthy of entering Valinor, that she's unworthy of entering heaven, and so chooses death instead. When she jumps off the boat, she's actually intending to die. Now that would definitely add an interesting edge to her character. The less dark way to do it is that Galadriel is just simply unable to let go of revenge, let go of Middle-earth. She doesn't join into the song that the other elves are singing. And so, Valinor rejects her. The boat vanishes, and Galadriel just plops down into the ocean, alone. Surprised and concerned with a kind of oh crap look on her face. That would have been way better. Then we have Gandalf. Now, I think I like the concept of what they're trying to do with this character. But the execution is terrible. The pacing of this show is glacial. Everything moves so slowly. I'm guessing what's going on with Gandalf is that he existed in some non-corporeal plane, and now that he's physical, everything to him is weird and confusing. That would be a pretty cool idea, a character getting used to physical existence for the first time. Kind of like a baby being born. But for all I know, I just made that up. The show doesn't really give us any hints or indications of what's happening with him or why he's acting the way he is. One of the biggest issues with this show, and part of why it's so boring, is that we, the audience, are never given enough information to be invested, to care emotionally or understand what's happening. For a counterexample, look at Game of Thrones Season 1. There's that scene where the mountain tries to kill Loras, because he just lost the joust. But the hound comes in and saves Loras. But right before that scene, we the audience learn that the mountain is the hound's brother and that the mountain intentionally burned his face as a child. Suddenly we understand the context of the scene, the motivation of the hound and why he feels compelled to protect Loras. If this scene happened in Rings of Power, they never would have explained the backstory. You'd just be expected to know the lore or you would learn afterwards after the emotions of the scene were gone. So the fight would be way more uninteresting. Instead of the continuation of a decades long conflict between brothers, it would just be two guys hitting each other with swords. Then we have Arendir, who's written completely backwards. I don't know if it's the actor's fault or the way his character is written and directed, but he's just so boring. He has the emotional range of a cardboard cutout of Keanu Reeves. Oddly enough, the elves in Lord of the Rings are normally supposed to be more stoic than the humans, but Arendir seems to be the only one that fit this classic elf mold. All the other elves seem pretty emotional about stuff. The whole thing is backwards. Arendir should be the most human of the elves. Maybe that's why he's hooking up with a town milk. Maybe that's why he's the only elf who's actually empathetic towards the humans. Maybe the other elves are bothered by how human he acts. So he's like a weird outsider, either accepted by the elves or the humans. I don't know, just something to make his character more interesting instead of so boring. And that's really the crux of the problem with Ring of Power. It's just a horribly boring show. I don't think it's the worst show ever written. I don't think we as a people should rise up and smite Amazon for making it. Though I completely understand why fans of Lord of the Rings would be very upset by it. But it's just so boring. Anyways, I guess with time we'll find out if my prediction is right. Whether Galadriel's a girl boss living in the current woke year, or if she on her quest for revenge brings about the very thing she seeks to destroy. Anyways, see you guys next week. Or check out my streaming channel in the description below. 